why didn't you contribute also? Then they say, look, you know, back at home there are NGOs, liberal media, coalition government, pressure, and so on and so forth. So actually, the reason why I think others cannot uh, implement a honest policy on migration is that uh, they feel themselves under pressure by international liberal mainstream media, NGOs, and political others. But, but in Hungary, we have a political stability, two-third majority in the parliament, so we have the luxury to say what we think and act accordingly. What's interesting is that that behavior is such a threat to our foreign policy establishment, sterile morons with lifelong history of failure and apple bomb and David from the people who really supported foreign adventures that hurt our country, hate Hungary and refer to it reflexively as a dictatorship and not as an Islamic democracy. Why do you think it's so threatening to them, this nation of 10 million people in Central Europe? Look, I think why they hate us is that uh, we are conducting a uh, patriotic, Christian-based policy. The target of ours is to uh, reach the, uh, to, uh, to fulfill the national interest. Uh, we are conservative, and in the meantime, we are successful. So basically, our existence is in danger for them because what they say is that the only way to have a progressive, successful political system is that you have to be extremely liberal. And our existence makes it very clear that no, this is not the only way to be progressive, to be successful, to fulfill uh, the interest of your nation. But our way, the conservative, patriotic, Christian democratic way, uh, you know, re respecting our historic and religious heritage, respecting our values like family, uh, this brings success also. So the reason why they want us to be beaten on the next election is that basically one of the last successful conservative government would be kicked out from power and that they could speak about the fact that, oh, look, liberal mainstream is the only successful ideology in the world. They see you as a much bigger threat than China, which just tells you. They're going to try to interfere. Finish the article, foreign minister. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else. Enemy armor is hit. Just one here in the Biden presidency and it's in turmoil. The pandemic the president promised to shut down is still out of control. Inflation is at a four-decade high, canceling out rising wages. The border is a Violent crime continues to climb, and many are now asking, why hasn't anyone been fired yet? This is Outnumbered. I'm Emily Cicano. Here today are my co-hosts, Kibbe McEnany and Karen Faulkner, former State Department spokesperson Morgan Ortega, and in the center seat, Fox and Friends co-host... Now, Time Magazine is marking President Biden's first year in office with a bleak capturing his rough presidency, showing the president being rained on with a giant cloud hovering over the Oval Office. Behind Biden are several boxes of those responded to COVID rapid tests. Six months ago, however, the same magazine showed President Biden looking tough, wearing his trademark aviators before his first meeting with Russia's Vladimir Putin. The White House hitting so many bumps in its first year. It has many Biden allies now asking who is going to be held accountable for this, starting with White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain. Kaylee McEnany, I can think of no better person to get first thoughts on this. That's really remarkable, those two covers that you had up there from time. What a fall from grace in just a few short months. And to get at really how bad things are in Washington, sometimes you have to read behind the lines, Emily, you know, looking at a story and the anonymous sourcing and kind of trying to read a little bit into what is going on. And I'll tell you this, at the beginning of the administration, a few months in, we started getting those Kamala Harris stories, as we've talked about here on Outnumbered, about the vice president's office being in turmoil. There was one CNN article that had almost three dozen sources. But largely, the Biden team has been pretty disciplined at not talking to press, not leaking. And Joe Biden's inner circle has been largely insulated from those types of stories. 
Intel now. Now we're seeing story after story with finger pointing at Ron Klain, among others. There's a CNN story that came out with guess how many sources? Three dozen sources about President Joe Biden. And interestingly, in that CNN article, one of the president's private conversations was leaked. Uh, it said this, that in private, Publicly, he told us he doesn't look at the poll numbers or he doesn't believe them. Rather, he told us that during his press conference. Well, privately, he's expressing exasperation that his message isn't breaking through and saying, quote, why is no one seeing it? So you now have people <laughs> leaking the president's conversations. Of course, the Trump administration was plagued with leaks from the very beginning. But this is a really right hand turn for the Biden administration that finally, as the Titanic is sinking, the finger pointing is starting. But unfortunately, wow. that Titanic is not just the Biden administration. It's our country. Oh, and Steve, so on that note, panning out from the White House to the greater public, we know now that per those recent polls Kaylee mentioned, 56% of Americans disapprove of Biden's performance and 70% of them do not want the It's hard to believe that Mint Mobile can be good at just $15 a month. So as Mint's new owner, Hello. Them, or if not, what if anything should be done to fix that? I have an idea. Uh, yes and nothing. There are plenty of them and nothing should be done. Uh, as often as not, these conversations have two side effects. First, this is interesting. They erase the women who do work in comics already by ignoring them. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, not a lot of people are talking about Annie Nascenti. Not a lot of people are talking about Louise Simonson, June Brigman. We could go on and on. I mean, there are some uh, women in comics who uh, are largely invisible the same way that men are invisible. Their gender just wasn't an issue because they were doing great work. You might look at their names and go, oh, that's interesting. A woman wrote Daredevil, wrote the incredible Daredevil line uh, that followed up Frank Miller's uh, second run on Daredevil. Uh, and created um, Typhoid Mary and a lot of really fantastic Daredevil villains and did it effortlessly, seemingly, uh, with a very, not really a drop in quality. People really loved Anne Nascenti. As great as Frank Miller was, people loved Anne Nascenti. Uh, the thing is, Anne Nascenti didn't make a big deal out of her gender. She realized this was largely a boys' club, a hobby that boys enjoyed, uh, superhero comics, that is, uh, and she wrote for them. Uh, that was why she succeeded. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, don't dismiss them as tokens or by discarding wholesale the areas of comics where women are often more, most numer numerous and visible. The difference between the questions, where are the women and why aren't there more women and why are so few women here is subtle but savage. And too often the latter two questions and their nuance are discarded in favor of a clean sweep of the former. So we've established our problem. We've established, uh, as uh, Mark Brooks puts it, a problem that is smaller doesn't exist at all. It's a very small problem, the idea that we need to, I don't know, force more women to work in comics when they, uh, and in particular superhero comics like the New 52, when they may or may not uh, want to. Uh, and uh, it doesn't really exist because there are already plenty of women who are doing fantastic work in comics and nobody, nobody notices, nobody really cares. It's just business, it's just fun, it's just a hobby. So here we go, moving on to step two make the problem seem massive and all encompassing. Okay, how do we do that? Well, the first thing that we do is we might wanna confront Dan DiDio. Uh, let's confront Dan DiDio right at a convention uh, where he's giving one of his cool panel discussions. I've been on many of these panels. Uh, as an artist, they're boring as hell because nobody cares what an artist has to say about anything. Uh, but this is interesting here. What really happened at the infamous Dan DiDio hire more women incident? Heidi McDonald, straight from Comics Alliance as well, I believe. Was she at Comics Alliance? Uh, she's another Whisper Network advocate and, uh, you know, left winger. Uh, somebody who's involved in all of this stuff. Uh, anyway, uh, somebody stood up and, and yelled at Dan, hire more women. Rich Johnson from Bleeding Cool added, maybe it should be Alex DeCampy. Alex DeCampy. 
oh, they're all, they all stick together. They all help each other. Rich Johnson, of course, uh, deeply involved in all of this, uh, part of the Whisper Network, recommending Alex DeCampi, who's one of the queen bees of that Whisper Network, uh, who deliberately incites uh, fear uh, in her peers. People are afraid of Alex DeCampi. You know, she has influence uh, with uh, with lefties. She knows she knows how to destroy people, and that's why they're afraid of her. Uh, somebody else yelled Nicholas Scott, which is interesting because Nicholas Scott was already working there. I remember very well. She was great. Uh, and uh, here, here's what happens. Dan just responds to this by saying, we're, we're just trying to hire the best people. Just the best people. And then uh, Heidi McDonald, I guess, saw red. But some of the best people are women. And Dan just finally goes, look, I know. We're, we're trying. Okay. So Dan DiDio evidently uh, not pleasing uh, Heidi McDonald about this. How do we take this and make it thermonuclear? Girls on film, how sexism is now destroying the comic book industry. Fantastic. Sexism is now destroying the comic book industry. Even as superheroes thrive at the box office, comics creators continue to employ sexist and misogynistic depictions of women. Now it's serious, guys. If we don't actually make a difference, we don't hire more women, uh, if we don't stop making women sexy and fun and cool and exciting the way that you know we do with all superhero characters, male or female, uh, I don't know, the comic book industry is going to be destroyed, according to uh, Monica uh, Bartziel in January of 2015. All right, 2015 now, at this point, by the way, should be uh, understood. Uh, the ESG program has been signed into legislation by Barack Obama. Barack Obama actually established, uh, under his uh, tenure, the U.S. Department of Labor uh, signed... Uh, the Environmental Social Governance Act, uh, which allowed companies to, uh, which allowed people to invest in companies for reasons other than profitability, reasons like, are they socially responsible? Uh, so now, uh, if you do, if you're able to show uh, that you are hiring more women and more diversity, uh, you, you companies can invest in your company just for that reason alone, whether you're profitable or not. Uh, so uh, now, boom, we've got a big problem here. Sexism is now officially destroying. Uh, the comic book industry that is uh that is terrible all right what's step three mark convince simple people like the uh soy boys in comics uh of said massive problem hmm all right so how are we going to do that that's interesting how about this market research says 46.67 
Yeah.